What's going on, everyone? Welcome to the Claims Podcast. I'm here with Laura Gregory, attorney, CPCU, which stands for Chartered Property Casualty Underwriter, which is quite a mouthful and quite a well-earned degree, I must say, which makes her unique in her field. Plus, she's an insurance coverage expert and bad faith attorney expert. Laura, it's a pleasure to have you on the podcast. Thanks so much for being on. Well, thank you for asking me. I'm happy to be here. So you're a partner at Sloan & Walsh. You've got a bunch of great degrees on your resume. Your LinkedIn is absolutely chock full with really good background on how you featured as a thought leader in both claims, legal, and related fields. Would you mind giving us and the listeners a little bit of a rundown of your career today, how you got into law, and where you are today? Uh, Sure. Well, how I got into law, I'm... uh... On, from a long line of lawyers, both my parents are lawyers. Uh, my father's a now retired law professor, and growing up, I wasn't sure what I wanted to do, but I was sure I didn't want to be a lawyer. Too many of those in the family already. So I went to college, was finishing up uh, my last year in college, and was not sure I was ready for the real world, and decided maybe that decision when I was seven, eight years old about not being a lawyer wasn't a good life choice to base it on a seven-year-old viewpoint. So I went and sat in on a couple of law school classes, figuring then I'd get educated and I could cross it off the list. Instead, I really enjoyed it. I was understanding the punchlines from jokes I'd heard my whole life and ended up applying to law school and going to law school. So you never know where you might end up. Um, And insurance... Insurance really started when I was in law school. I was a research assistant for uh, Alan Whitus at the University of Iowa, who at the time had sort of the treatise on um, uninsured and underinsured motorist coverage. And he was my contracts teacher my first year. So when I was working for him, I did a lot of stuff with insurance. I ended up uh, reviewing an updated edition of um, an insurance treatise that he was doing with Judge Keaton here in Boston, and that sort of sucked me into insurance. Then I ended up working a summer during law school for an attorney who did insurance coverage and liked it, and now I've been doing it for almost 30 years. Wow, impressive. And it seems that your firm practices mainly in the insurance realm and kind of focuses on that uh, from a claims and kind of bad faith point of view. Would you mind sharing a little color on what's kind of involved in the day-to-day of that? Um, Well, the day-to-day over the last few uh, months, as we've all been in our houses working, has has been interesting. Uh, I always make jokes about how everyone thinks coverage lawyers are so boring and what we do is so boring. And there have been so many COVID-19 insurance issues that have come up. Um, One of the things I've been doing on LinkedIn is trying to uh, get information out to both insurance people, but also to non-insurance people so they can understand how some of these issues play and why they're important. Um, and I, I do litigation, but I don't spend as much time in court as probably what people think of litigators, uh, especially if you're using TV as a basis. Um, but when I'm in court, it tends to be a big issue. We have a lot of decisions um, that are done on summary judgment. So instead of having a trial, you have an argument with the other side arguing their position and the judge ultimately deciding, um, which I really enjoy. I like the intellectual challenge of of coverage, uh, and to me it's always interesting. Every case is a little bit different, even if you're dealing with the same policy language that you've done in other cases, all facts are different. Uh, So I think it's great, and uh, I'm glad to be doing what I'm doing. Many others are probably glad that I'm doing it and not them. (laughs) (laughs) Right. And outside of this context of what's going on right now with the pandemic, what are some of the typical pain points, I suppose, that an attorney at a firm like yours would kind of experience? And is, is there anything that if you could have a magic wand and turn off or remove in your day to day role outside of extreme events like this? or some elements you wish were improved, either on the tech side, on the general process that you have to go through, whether that's in court or otherwise, what are kind of the high level pain points for uh, folks in your position, partners at uh, claims focused firms? Good question. Um, 
I think one of the things, and I don't think there's a solution to it, but one of the things that's always a challenge for uh, me and uh, coverage attorneys, whatever side of the uh, individual case they may be on, is about taking something that can be very complex and making it understandable. For the most part, our judges, unless they have had cases in the past with uh, insurance issues, will not have seen your particular issue. And some are better at understanding how the different pieces fit, put to, or fit together than others. Uh, one of the things that I like about my job but is challenging is to take something that could be a six-step analysis process and make it as straightforward as possible so as to be able to walk the judge through that analysis and have them get to the result that you want. Um, and one of the things I like about it is that I do a lot of writing and that that advocacy through writing is is something I enjoy. Many people don't enjoy it. And I think that's why many people are happy to not be coverage lawyers. It's it's um, more academic than many uh, types of law, particularly in litigation, which is why I like it, but again, why other people would rather be in court questioning witnesses or things like that, which happens less often in the context of coverage. It does happen, but just not as often. Right, no, that makes sense. On the other side of that, what would you say kind of makes a great firm in an industry like this? What are the kind of standout features or best practices you think of a firm that's going to be very successful within the realm of representing insurers and insureds? Well, coverage is all about the details. And it's like uh, I frequently say on uh, LinkedIn, the devil is in the details you always have to get down to the minutia and in order to to do it well you have to be willing to do that you have to put in the time to you know look at all the different parts of the policy to figure out the uh relevant facts in whatever your claim scenario is and then put all those pieces together and it's a long, it can be a long process, especially if it's a complicated policy or a complicated set of facts or both. And to me, it's a puzzle that I like putting together and figuring out how all the pieces work together and how they fit or don't fit. Uh, others find it tedious. So, um, But if you're going to be doing this kind of work, you need to have people who put that time and attention into the details and make right. sure that they understand how all the different pieces and parts fit together. Speaking of the strength side of things, and thanks for that feedback, very helpful to know, you seem to be a LinkedIn powerhouse user or an absolute beast at writing tons of content on LinkedIn. Was that something you consciously started to do, you were encouraged to do uh, by your firm or just spontaneously happened and that's the first part and the second part is have, has that had a material impact on your professional experience uh well i i basically started on my own last fall i'd had a a linkedin space so to speak that i you know had my name there and had some basic information for quite a while but hadn't really done much with it uh and to be honest i'm not a huge social media user on any platform um, well, now I am on LinkedIn, but not anything else. <laughs> and uh, I had gone to a lot of networking events and never felt like I got as much out of them as the time and effort took. And so I decided to make an effort to put a post up five days a week on LinkedIn for at least three months and see how it went. That to me, it's a win-win because I'm hopefully getting my name and information out there. It's also keeping me up to date because I'm trying to put some sort of insurance content up five days a week. Uh, so that's been great for me. I, I feel like I'm very up to date on what's happening on a variety of different issues. Uh, and we certainly haven't been short on content with the uh, COVID-19 experience. Uh, 
Right. And also, I've gotten to know so many people. I've gotten exposure to many different areas that I'm, I wasn't familiar with. And uh, in that respect, it's been fabulous. Um, I have connected to two of your previous podcast uh, guests, uh, Trisha Baxter <laughs> and Jim Patillo, through LinkedIn, who I did not know outside of that, uh, and uh, have enjoyed that. The other thing is I'm hoping ultimately maybe this will uh, lead to some business, and I've had a few things here or there, and um, we'll, we'll see how that uh, plays out. But ultimately I'm hoping to uh, expand my client base as well. But that's right. an organic thing, and uh, I'm not seeking to do that on any post, just overall building relationships that I hope will will end up in – in uh, a client relationship down the road. Right. No, I think that makes a ton of sense. I think inbound or, as you say, organic content where it's genuinely putting out value-add pieces for people to read and kind of attach into and, and learn about a new subject are um, interesting ways to get new contacts. And whether that turns into something or it doesn't, it's definitely a means to become a thought leader, which you are most definitely in that category on LinkedIn. Uh, we're not sponsored by LinkedIn or anything. I just think it's interesting that you run such a tight ship on that. Uh, curious if you have any tips to someone who would be starting a new firm in this kind of space. What would be the key elements that you would advise someone in this space as a, as a brand new law firm to do or make sure they're doing on the, the business side of things or maybe it's just general thought leadership marketing any elements outside of LinkedIn that you found very valuable as a law firm? Well, I'm also active in a couple of different organizations, um, which I think is useful both um, on building relationships with other lawyers and uh, keeping up to date both on skills and um, legal issues. Uh, I have just completed two terms, a total of six years on the Mass Defense Lawyers Association board, which has been great. Uh, unusual to have a coverage person, frankly, on that board. It tends to be more litigators, uh, employment lawyers, products, things like that. Uh, so it was, it was great for me to have that exposure to other areas that I don't see as often uh, on a straight defense basis. Um, so I've enjoyed that. Also, I, uh, which isn't directly related to sort of marketing, uh, but I have spent a lot of time doing community service. I am just starting my second term as a member of the Andover, Massachusetts Select Board, which is an odd New England uh, form of government. But um, And I look forward to serving my community in that way uh, for at least another three years. We'll see what happens after that. Interesting. That makes a ton of sense. Slightly softer question, but along those lines, curious if you've found one thing either in your personality or an aspect of your work that you've done that's added a lot of value to you, either personally or career-wise. Do you have a, a claim superpower or something that you consider sets either you or your firm apart from other groups like you or people like you potentially uh, out there? Um, superpower. Hmm. I um, I was drawn into your CPCU as an interesting certification that was rare. I had I actually admittedly had to look that up. So apologies if I'm putting you on the spot <laughs> with this at all. But I think it's an interesting uh, certification that you have that's it's pretty unique. Well, the great thing about the CPCU, and it is fairly unusual for lawyers to also be a CPCU, um, but the CPCU is an insurance designation, so it's not aimed at lawyers. Uh, so obviously lawyers can be it. Uh, and the CPCU is a education air training essentially for, it's primarily oriented towards, well, now I was going to say claims, but that's not true. Uh, it's, it, it covers all different aspects of the industry. So the thing that I found the most helpful, there were some areas of it that were very easy for me because they're, things like they have a legal section and having to uh, go through the exam for the legal section was much different for me as a lawyer as it would be for an insurance person who didn't have the legal background. 
On the other hand, we learned about um, oh, reinsurance, about uh, underwriting, about how uh, different uh, technologies within companies work, how reserving works, uh, how all the different policies work. There are covers many different kinds of policies, um, marine policies, crime policies, um, you know, the homeowner's policies, auto policies, CGL policies, um, did some on D&O policies, EPL policies were just starting really at the time I was doing it. Uh, so I didn't learn as much on that through that program, but a very broad amount of things to learn about, which gave me a good handle on the industry from more the industry perspective, which is really useful in doing what I do. And also it gave me more of a perspective on how the different parts of an insurance company work or sometimes don't work together and how that could impact on a particular situation. Right. Interesting. And if I may be so bold, I'd love to suggest another strength of yours, which is, as you already mentioned, your writing. And for anyone who's not following you on LinkedIn, I highly recommend looking up Laura M. Gregory, attorney, CPCU, and following you for all the articles that you put out. So interesting. And at least daily, it looks like, but I'm not sure the variance there, but there's a ton of content in here, which is a great read for anyone in either legal or insurance. If I can switch into a slightly softer area as well, love to see well, that you're very thank active. You for, in thank you for marketing my LinkedIn for me. <laughs> well, I think it's, it's packed full of content and I think it's pretty rare or it takes a lot of work to do it. So I think it's, it's increasingly uh, an area that I think is probably valuable for folks trying to learn about legal insurance, technology, anything in this kind of space finding folks like you with a ton of content is, is a really educational experience, at least for uh, me as someone learning into the space from a technology background before. So appreciate all that you're putting out and you seem to be pretty well, active. You. Yeah. You're most welcome. And, and you, you put a lot into, it seems of that, uh, obviously your, your career as well, but wanted to slightly pivot into your work uh, on the volunteer side of things, which I think is a really interesting part of your overall character or profile, uh, would love to hear if you're okay sharing a little bit about your experience with the uh, Andover Select Board and your recent re-election, congratulations by the way, and, and how you got Thank into you. that and what you kind of do. Um, well, how I got into it, I had been pretty active. Uh, so first of all, this uh, Andover is a town of about 35,000 people. We're about 25 miles north of Boston. Uh, and how I got into it, I've lived here since my kids were very young and started getting involved in sort of local government when they were in school and there were budget issues that were impacting on the schools and began to learn how all of these different processes worked and kind of had it in the back of my head that maybe sometime I'd think about doing it. But my kids were young and I had a lot of things on my plate, so pushed it to the side. Uh, fast forward uh, three years ago, my youngest at the time was 15 and my oldest was 17 and I wasn't happy with how the board had how the select board it was called the board of selectmen then we changed the name to gender neutral um, but uh, how they were handling things it was not very civil there was a lot of fighting and accusations and it was it was not good for the town they weren't sort of advancing things, and the uh, seat that was up was unopposed. So I had several people suggest to me that I should run and sort of tried to gather up who I thought would support me and whether I'd be able to, to get things together because it was right at the last minute and uh, was able to actually file the signatures to be on the ballot on literally the last day. Um, ran a short but uh, ultimately successful campaign and was able to beat the incumbent in March of 2017. Um, and then fast forward three years and my re-election, I was also opposed, um, but not by a frankly very serious uh, uh, candidate. So uh, I was glad to have won, although the campaign turned into a much different situation this year. We were supposed to have the election in March. 
uh, which did not happen. And instead, we had absentee ballots and a election in June where everyone was wearing masks and socially distant, and it happened. So that was good, but but <laughs> a unique situation. Uh, hopefully unique. Hopefully we can be past this by the next round of elections, but right. it's a process. No, it's interesting. I think it goes a long way to say, uh, kind of be the change you want to see in the world. If I can nick a Gandhi quote there, but but it's great to see you both uh, active in your personal life and uh, your career life and kind of making sure that anything that needs to get done gets done. And if you want to see it done right, do it yourself. But uh, being active <laughs> in both of those is very inspirational. And uh, I think it's two, two different sides of the same coin where uh, it's kind of very apropos for what's going on right now in in the world. So thank you for participating in that well, and making it better. I would also say my firm has been very supportive and we have a history of um, community involvement. We, several of the partners have been on um, select boards in their town uh, or uh, moderators of town meeting. The, the New England style of government is, is unique uh, in town. So anyone who's not from here isn't going to really understand, but Essentially, we've, we have a number of individuals who have been in elected positions in their communities, and they were happy to support me uh, in continuing along with that tradition. So that was um, uh, very helpful as well. If they hadn't been supportive, it would be difficult to, to do both jobs. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. So it's, it's good to hear that Sloane Walsh has also got your back as well. This has been absolutely fantastic. I'm noticing that we're coming up to about 30 minutes here. So I want to give you a chance to provide any closing, closing thoughts, excuse me, or final parting thoughts that you would leave the listeners with. And then I'll ask if there's a way to get in touch, but uh, we'd love to know any thoughts you have on uh, kind of the future. If you're going to continue down the thought leadership route, or if you're going to add any value uh, in other ways, but uh, I think that is more than enough. So we'd love to know any uh, parting thoughts and then we can hear how we can get in touch with you. Well, as far as continuing with the community leadership, I'm certainly in for the next three years, and we'll, we'll see what happens then. Uh, I'm enjoying it and feel like I'm, I'm uh, working hard for the residents of my community, and we've got a lot to deal with right now with uh, COVID-19 and creating an environment for anti-racism in our town. Uh, these are going to be long-term things to deal with, and I look forward to working with my community on those. Uh, as far as on the work front, I continue to love what I'm doing as far as insurance coverage and uh, enjoy working with uh, companies and insureds on coverage issues and expect to continue to be doing that for quite some time. So hopefully uh, it will continue to be something that that is working for all involved and um and i'm going to keep up on linkedin as well hopefully <laughs> <That's hilarious. laughs> it, it is a a commit a daily commitment and my 1200 characters or less is a, always a challenge daily to Imagine. put things out there but um hopefully i'll keep up with it yeah, that stay, makes sense. Stay tuned to see. <laughs> well, I'm excited. You've got 3,600 people plus who are actively following you. So we all wait with bated breath. Yes, my goal is to have 5,000 by September 1. So we'll, wow. we'll see if that happens. <laughs> well, let's hope we I can help the, you with this. I crossed the 3,500 uh, actually on election day. So Tuesday was wow. a good day. <laughs> I can imagine. Yeah. Sounds like it. Uh, so how, how can we get in touch with you, Laura? If, if folks want to learn more about you and your writing, what are the best ways to reach out or find out more? Uh, well, you can reach me on uh, LinkedIn through a uh, um, direct message. Uh, again, it's uh, Laura M. Gregory, what is it? Attorney CPCU, I think. That's right. Um, and uh, or you can shoot me an email, which is L Gregory at Sloan S L O A N E Walsh W A L S H dot com, and glad to uh, uh, have communications and conversations with people there. Wonderful. Well, everyone, this has been Laura Gregory, attorney, CPCU, insurance and legal expert. It's been an absolute pleasure having you on, Laura. We've got to get you back on for a little bit more of a double click on many different elements that you talked about today. So first and foremost, thank you. And it's been an absolute pleasure. 
Oh, excellent. Thank you so much.